Lots of ships use the harbour at the big station by the sea. The passenger ships have spotless paint and shining brass. Other ships, though smaller and dirtier, are important too. They take coal, machinery and other things abroad and bring back meat, timber and things we need. Fishing boats also come there. They unload their fish on the quay. Some of it is sent to shops in the town and some goes in a special train to other places far away. The railway men call this train the Flying Kipper. He was ready at five o'clock. There was snow and frost. Men hustled and shouted, loading the vans with crates of fish. The last door banged. The guard showed his green lamp and Henry started off. What do you get when you combine determination, dedication, an unbelievable work ethic and a refusal to give up? Well, you get Henry. Henry's story is both vast, sad, but most of all, inspiring. We've got a lot to unpack here, so let's take a closer look at the story of Henry the Green Engine. This is Henry. Henry is a 460 heavy goods engine who works for the Northwestern Railway on the island of Sodor. A familiar face around those parts, Henry was one of the first engines to be bought by the railway. However, when he first arrived, Henry didn't look like this, but rather like this. So what happened between then? Well, let's dive in. Henry was built in 1919 to a design of Sir Nigel Gressley of the Great Northern Railway. By then, the main express locomotives of the Great Northern were the C1 Atlantics. However, by the late 1910s, they had started to struggle with ever-increasing loads. To fix this, Gressley designed a three-cylinder 460 locomotive, with the intended use of this locomotive to be a prototype for a new class of heavy express locomotives. What emerged was Henry. Although very similar to a C1 in appearance, there were some differences. The most obvious difference was the wheel arrangement, but there were others. Smaller driving wheels, three cylinders, and a new boiler design. In order for the boiler to fit in between the set of driving wheels at the back, the firebox had to be reduced in size. However, the resulting firebox in question proved to be too small. During testing, operating crews found it almost impossible for Henry to build up sufficient steam, which resulted in several stops and slower runs. And despite several attempts to fix his performance, Henry never really proved to be a success. Much to the annoyance of the railway's board of directors, especially the sitting chairman, Frederick Banbury. Allegedly, Banbury hated Henry for his terrible performance and wanted them gone from the roster as quickly as possible. However, this wouldn't be so easy for him, as despite his poor performance, Henry had become a railway icon. Now this wasn't due to his performance, but rather his character. Henry had become the definition of determination and dedication, with his incredible work ethic proving to be endearing for the public. Banbury wasn't a fan of this, but there wasn't much he could do about it. That was until a letter came from Sir Topham Hatt. Topham was in need of a new express locomotive and wanted to purchase one of the C1 Atlantics. By this point, the A1s had already been introduced, so Topham thought that there were some spares that wasn't used anymore. Frederick, however, was furious with this request. He didn't want to sell the railway's prized locomotive class, so instead, Frederick authorized for Henry to be the engine going to Sodor, lying to Topham that he would be getting an Atlantic. The purchase was finalized and Henry was sent on his way. When Henry arrived, Topham was mostly confused. It wasn't what he ordered, but after Henry presented his side of the story, Topham softened a bit. Having heard about the so-called Great Northern Catastrophe, which Henry had been nicknamed, Topham knew a bit about his character, and despite warnings from Henry about his performance, Topham saw potential. He eventually kept Henry and put him to work on express trains. However, these would prove to be a bit of a mess. Henry had a very mixed record. On some days, he performed fine and kept a schedule, but other days, he could barely move. Whenever this happened, the existing engines had to cover for him, with the most common occurrence being Lenny and Edward double-heading the express trains, as neither could handle them by themselves. 
After one year, Topham decided that it was time to fix the express trains and he purchased Gordon to take care of them. Gordon, who was ironically one of the engines built to replace Henry, would put the Sargent express trains on the map, while Henry was delegated to heavy goods work. This proved to be more in his favor, as his boiler had a better chance of keeping up with steam production. It still wasn't perfect, and there were several occasions where Henry had to stop and rest so his boiler could build up more steam, but despite this, Henry pressed on, sticking to his character traits. However, by 1927, Henry was getting overloaded with goods work, after Lenny had left the island following the end of his loan. So to help Henry, Merlin was brought in to help. Merlin ended up taking care of most of the railway's heavy goods work so Henry could get some more time to rest. This, however, didn't mean that Henry didn't work. When he did work, he worked to the top. Often he could be seen with long and heavy goods trains, sometimes totaling over a thousand tons. Henry refused to call it quits. He pushed on despite his hardships. The real bugger causing his poor performance at this time was his small firebox. And despite Topham's best efforts, he struggled to make Henry feel better. This was, however, until 1930, when Henry was tried out with imported Welsh coal. This would be the experiment that finally proved to do something about his steaming abilities. When he left the works following his trials with the new coal, Henry was like a different engine. Much faster, much more powerful, much more efficient. Henry was really flying, passing all expectations by a considerable amount. With his new power, Henry could finally show his real strengths, putting his character traits to good use. And with Jeffrey arriving the same year, the Northwestern goods sector was performing exceptional. However, there was still an underlying problem. The thing is, the Welsh coal wasn't a perfect solution to Henry's problems. It was more expensive, it was more difficult to transport it due to it having to be separated from the other coal, and since Henry was the only one using it, many argued the overall efficiency of the concept, factoring in the additional shipping difficulties and the overall price. All these factors were in combinations with the biggest and most obvious problem. It didn't fix the size of Henry's firebox. It was still smaller than it should be. So, many of you right now might be asking yourself, why was it never fixed sooner? Well, it was because the Topham couldn't afford the required overhaul. And I'm not talking about price here. I'm talking about Topham not being able to afford enough time for Henry to be out of service. Since the early days of the railways needed Henry to be in service. With the arrival of Jeffrey and Welsh Cole, Topham was now a little more hesitant in pursuing a full rebuild of Henry, which the whole ideal had become by this point. Now this was partly because the investment in Welsh Cole was expensive and difficult to set up, but it was mostly because, even by this point, he didn't think that the Crovensgate works had the expertise and scale to carry out such a project. So for now, the rebuild was shelved and Henry kept on using Welsh Cole. However, in 1934, a special person came to the island who relit interest in the rebuild for Henry. This man was William Stanier. Having been appointed chief mechanical engineer for the London Midland and Scottish Railway two years earlier, he had been one of the main influences in patching up the former LMS and NWR rivalry. Stanier was a longtime friend of Topham, with both serving as apprentices for Swinton Works back in the day. Stanier's visit was originally for business with regards to a possible upgrade for Barrow and Finesse Station, in order to increase capacity. But while being introduced to Henry by Topham, the whole debacle with Henry's rebuild was brought up, which Stanier was quickly fascinated by. Later during the visit, while they were talking about it again, Stanier suggested that Topham could have Henry be rebuilt by the LMS. While Topham thought of it as nothing more than a kind gesture, Stanier was serious about the idea. And after talking further about it, Stanier suggested that Henry in rebuild form could be based upon his recently introduced Black 5 locomotives. Topham, knowing how good these locomotives were, was interested. They didn't talk much more about it during Stanier's visit, given that it wasn't the original purpose of his trip, but Topham did say to Stanier that he would get back to him about the idea. Little did he know, the timing of the proposal couldn't have come at a better time. This was because, just half a year after Stanier's visit, something would happen that brought this proposal in full swing. On January 18th, 1935, at 5 o'clock, Henry went out with the island's famous fish train, the Flying Kipper. It was a run like any other, with Henry having the rails mostly to himself. This meant that he was allowed to go faster. While the snowy environment restricted him somewhat, he was still allowed to go faster than the railway's usual goods trains. But just after running through Kronk, Henry passed a signal which was showing green. However, up ahead, parked on the main line, was another early goods train, which was headed by Donald. The train had suffered a hotbox and was waiting for the axle to cool down, on seeing the train ahead, there was little Henry could do. When light broke a few hours later, what was revealed was tragic. 
The Kildane crash would go down as the most infamous railway accident on Sodor, despite it not being the worst one the island suffered. Miraculously, there were no fatalities in the crash, as everybody had gotten out of the way, including the staff in the brake van and Henry's crew, who had jumped train before impact. Despite traveling at over 50 miles an hour, the large piles of snow meant that Henry's crew got off lightly. However, the same thing could not be said for Henry. Taking the brunt of the impact, Henry was left in a terrible state. The mess was quickly cleaned up, and following that, an investigation was launched into the cause of the accident. Now, the reason to why this crash remains so infamous amongst the Sudrians is because unlike some of the railway's other accidents, the cause of the Kildan crash was an act of Mother Nature. A set of points which were to diverge Henry past Donald had frozen solid. After the signalman realized this, he quickly set the signals for danger. However, these set of signals had also frozen solid. By this point, it was too late to do anything more. The signalman in question never received any penalties for his actions, but feeling that he was at fault of it all, he did take one month away from work to seek therapy. As for Henry, after he was transferred to Crovin's gate, the workman determined that the only sensible thing to do was a full overhaul. Henry, feeling incredibly down, was at the brink of throwing in the towel, until Topham surprised him with something, something that Henry had completely forgotten about. Henry had been briefed about the Stania rebuild before, but he didn't take it seriously. But Topham, seeing the crash as the perfect opportunity for Henry to receive the rebuild, arranged for Henry to be sent off to crew to undergo the rebuild. Henry, cautious at first, eventually went along with it, and two weeks after the crash, Henry was sent off to crew to undergo the ambitious rebuild. Now, how the rebuild in question was carried out is still unknown to this day. Rebuilds had happened before, but not to such a scale, so there was a risk for it to go wrong. Fortunately, the rebuild was carried out without any fault, and what emerged from crew works was something quite extraordinary. Henry was no longer a failed Grizzly Express locomotive, now he was a modern, classy and stylish Black 5. While Henry was mostly a pure Black 5, there were a few differences. For example, in order to make sure that he would be capable for heavy goods work, Henry was fitted with larger cylinders at 20 inches rather than the 18 and a half inches of the Black 5s. However, the most noticeable change from the Black 5s was Henry's livery, sporting a new darker green paint. But, in essence, he was still a Black 5. When Henry returned to Sodor, Charles quickly showed that nothing was lost during the rebuild. In fact, his performance was even better than before. And now, finally fitted with a proper firebox, Henry didn't need the special wells coal anymore, so the import of it could stop. This was a good thing, given that a scaling bag of imported coal had happened following the recent opening of the Marston Heights coal mine, which was now supplying coal to the island. Henry was finally rid of his former troubles, and could now show himself to his greatest extent. He was still proving excellent on heavy goods trains, sometimes even matching Peter, who had arrived to fill in for him. But with his steaming ability now no longer in trouble, Henry also proved to be exceptional at holding express trains, sometimes substituting Gordon and Reginald in the Wild Western. But despite being capable of this, Henry mostly stuck to heavy goods work. Henry's strong performance proved vital in World War II, with the Northwestern Railway supplying the war effort with coal trains from Marston Heights and the recently opened Kirk Ronan coal mine, along with steel and iron from the Peel Godred Ironworks. While a burden to be sure, Henry carried out his work without a hitch, and by the end of the war, statistics showed that Henry had been the engine of the Northwestern Railway who had hauled the most amount of goods during the conflict. Truly impressive. Since then, Henry has stuck to heavy goods work. Nowadays, he runs the heavy goods trains along with Peter, Jeffrey, Murdoch, Merlin, Patrick, Walter, and Wilbur. He's also in charge of the Flying Kipper, given that he's now the dedicated engine running the service, much to his delight, given that it's his favorite train to pull. Henry has always managed to keep up with modern demands and remains a railway icon. Henry's an engine whose determination shall not go unnoticed. His refusal to give up is to be admired. Despite several challenges almost sealing his fate, Henry has pushed on with sheer will to do his job to his best abilities. Henry's story is both touching and inspirational, and he's destined to be celebrated for decades to come. Henry liked being at crew, but was glad to come home. A crowd of people waited to see him arrive in his new shape. He looked so splendid and strong, that they gave him three cheers. <laughs>